Hi, thanks for joining me in the Louis file today. Today we're going to continue on with our subject or our topic of temptation. And uh, I want to start off by telling you a uh, sort of a personal story, I guess you'd say, uh, really about my wife, but, it, but you know, when it involves her, it involves me. <laughs> Bible says that we become one flesh, right? So, so uh, my wife had this uh, uh, job that she, I don't think the work itself bothered her so much, but the environment she was in, the people she was around, uh, she was having a really hard time, really tough time getting along with and understanding, you know, different moods and attitudes that people had. So she really struggled and, and she came home day after day, tore up about it, some days crying, uh, like real tears, not just upset. Other days she wanted to scream. Uh, she really, really struggled. And I struggled because every day, and the, for the men out there, the husbands out there, you'll get this. We want to fix the problem. We don't want to just sit and talk about it. We want to fix it. Well, there's a lot of stuff we just can't, simply can't fix. And uh, this is one of those things. Um, but one day in particular, she came home and she told me with tears in her eyes, she said, Louie, I feel like all I'm hearing is the enemy, the voice of the enemy. Well, it, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bible guy. I mean, so I, anytime she brings these things to me like this, I, I, I attempt to find scriptural responses. So in the moment she told me this, she said, it seems like all I can hear is the, the voice of the enemy. Somehow or some way, I mean, this, this Holy Spirit, God showed, he started to reveal something to me, and he showed me, that, you know, uh, Jesus himself, at the most crucial point in his life, the one thing that he, is, he was, the main focus of what he was called to do was go to the cross and die for our sins, be buried and raised back. Uh, you know, if you look at the account of him on the cross, it, it can be argued that the only thing he heard was the voice of the enemy. Uh, they were taunting him, you know, if you're the Savior, uh, save yourself and come down from there. Save all of us, you know, and, and they were, they spit on him and mocked him. And, uh, and at one point, Jesus even said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we could get into a conversation about whether or not he was really forsaken or not, but that's not the point of this video, per se. But the idea, what I'm getting, what I want you to see is, is that Jesus right in the bullseye of his father, God's will, uh, felt completely forsaken and abandoned, and, he, and all he heard was mocking and accusing, or we could say the voice of the enemy, right? So I thought, oh my gosh, uh, this is, this is uh, it's not unusual. This, is, this may be exactly what is supposed to be happening here. So then that led me to uh, John chapter 10, and there's a Voice, a voice, a verse in John 10, it says, John 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But then if you jump back a little bit, uh, in John 10, he says, John 10, 4 and 5, it says, When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Okay. So Jesus' voice, the good shepherd's voice, the sheep, his sheep know his voice. That's all great. But then look at John 10, 5. It says, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Oh my gosh. So this, this really hit me hard. All of a sudden I realized, you know what, what's really being said here is Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He says, a stranger they won't follow, but, but he's not saying that they won't hear the voice of the stranger, the false shepherd, the one that's attempting to steal, kill, and destroy the sheep. So this really helped me in my attempting to help my wife to see that maybe hearing the voice of the enemy, as awful as it is, and as much condemnation and accusation that comes from that, that doesn't mean in and of itself that you're not in the will of God. Jesus, once again I will say, Jesus was exactly in the will of God. At the moment he was in the will of God, he felt abandoned. He couldn't hear his father. He, he, he couldn't hear the voice of God. All he heard was accusation, condemnation. 
he had to have been thinking, maybe I was wrong. This can't, what have I done wrong? Is there anything that I've done? I mean, all of those feelings probably came to him in that moment. And having those feelings and having those thoughts in and of themselves are not sinful. And this is what I'm trying to get across to you guys in these, this little series of videos here about temptation is that it's common to man, it's normal. So what are we to do? What are we to do when we're, when we're feeling attacked in, in all of this? Well, we look in Ephesians 6 is one thing we do. In Ephesians 6, and I'm not going to read all these verses, but Ephesians 6, familiar verses, what we call spiritual warfare. The Apostle Paul defines for us the armor of God, and he tells us in this chapter, he says, our match, our wrestling match, our fight, our battle, our warfare is not against flesh and blood. So we can scratch that off the list when a co-worker, a boss, a neighbor, a parent, a child, the cops, the judges, the politicians, <laughs> the foreigners, whoever it is that you're perceiving to be your enemy, the Bible clearly tells us the one you're seeing with these eyes is not the real enemy. Flesh and blood is not the real enemy. And that also includes you yourself. You yourself are, are not your real enemy. And this, I'll just throw this in here. People say this all the time. I, I just beat myself up. Well, if you look at that a little closer, that's not really true because you yourself are not your enemy. There's another enemy and he's not flesh and blood. So Paul tells us what to do. He tells us to stand. He tells us to take a stand and stand. And then he describes for us that we, we put on the armor. Well, he's saying that we put on this armor, which is really describing for us Christ himself, salvation and righteousness and truth, right? All of these things are really descriptions of Christ. So Paul's already determined and shown us that we are, when we have been placed into Christ, we've been baptized into Christ, and in Ephesians, earlier in the letter of Ephesians, he says, put off the old man and put on Christ, right? So he's already telling us this. So we're standing in Christ. So we stand in who he is. Uh, so we're in him. So when the adversary, the enemy, looks at us, he sees Christ. You know, we're, we're, we're fond of saying that when God looks at us, he sees Christ. But what about the enemy? See, we're standing in his armor. It's God's armor. It's not some armor he, it's not Louis's armor. It's God's armor. So we take our stand in who he is and we're, and we're kept, we're, we're protected. So we're called to be strong in the Lord and in the strength or power of his might. Left to ourselves, we'll fall every time. I got a friend of mine, Brian Coatney. I've shared a few He's done a few videos for the Louis file. He has this keeper's creed, and he says this. He says, Lord, you and I both know that I would commit any and all sin if you were not keeping me. And I thank you that you are keeping me. See, he, he doesn't only recognize that God can keep you, can keep me, but he goes on, he pushes on by faith and says, thank you that you are. And that's what Paul is really saying here. He says, you put on this armor and you stand in this armor. You stand in who Christ is and who he is in you and who you are in him. <laughs> and God will be your keeper. Now the storm and the warfare might just rage. You might get pounded on the outside with all kinds of thoughts and feelings of condemnation and self-hatred and, and, uh, and an accusation. All that stuff can still rage, but you're in armor. I'll tell you a story one t I read one time. Uh, a, a Chinese uh, guy named Watchman Nee told a story of the Chinese and the Japanese, I believe it was, uh, that were in a war, a, a skirmish, and one of the military soldiers was in a tank, and the rest, the, the opposing side were on foot with, with guns, hiding behind rocks and trees. So the one in the tank, he's secure, right? He's he, there's nothing that people, the guys, the soldiers on foot can really do. They come up with a plan. They say, here's what we're going to do. So one on this side pops out from behind a tree and shoots at the tank. Ping, ding, ding. And then he ducks back. Well, the guy in the tank, of course, he's looking through the scope and he swings around trying to see who shot at him and he can't, he can't find him. So someone on this side, a foot soldier, pops up, shoots at him from this side and ducks back behind a rock. Well, the guy in the tank swings back around. 
This goes on for a period of time until finally the guy in the tank gets frustrated because he can't see who's shooting at him. So he lifts the lid of the tank, pops his head out, and one of the soldiers on foot shoots him. So the lesson is, stay in the tank. Paul is saying it's the armor, and I'm saying it's the tank, but what it is is the spirit, and it's the identity of who we are in Christ. That's what we stay in. Walk after the spirit. Stand in the armor. Stand in who Christ is in you. Stand in who you are in him. And if we do that, we will extinguish all the flaming darts, all of the stuff that comes at us, the accusation, the condemnation, the lies, will come and we'll be tempted to stick our head out. You know what happens is, is if we start trying to fight the flesh and the temptations in the flesh, we're going to go down. We're going to go down every time. So, I hope that uh, through all these videos and this, these videos about temptation that you will come away with one conclusion. Being a human being, being man, uh, it's normal to have thoughts and feelings we don't like. But when we're trying to manage them, we will get caught out every time. Because what we're doing is we're trying to fight the flesh by the flesh. Can't work. Can never work. But we have to come to learn that. Uh, it's only by way of the Spirit. It's not by power nor by might, but by the Spirit is what the Bible tells us. So that's it for today. I thank you for watching. I uh, would ask that if this has helped you, that you would share it with your friends and tell them to, uh, to come on over and watch the Louis file and uh, see if it doesn't help you along your Christian walk. Uh, so all right, I'll talk to you next time. I'll see you later on the Louis file.